Hi guys, thank you very much uh, for coming. Um, so uh, my name's Adam, and uh, I uh, have got a little talk here for you, and I'm so glad it's not scientific because I have so nothing to prove. Uh, there's just, uh, the idea is uh, I want to give kind of a quick uh, mythology storytelling 101 with a uh, hint of PR built into it, and uh, I'll be a little bit tethered to my script here, uh, and I've lost my glasses this morning, so pardon me for not, I can't even see uh, this, so sorry. Um, so I've been uh, involved in some way or another in the creative end of the film and TV business for about 12 years, and almost specifically, uh, I've directed uh, animations, show opens, um, I've run a design department, and uh, I typically develop fun and advantageous marketing ideas for uh, the production company that I've been with for these 12 years. Um, I usually help them with marketing ideas for uh, the properties that we own or that our clients own. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, technically, that kind of makes me a creative director, which is great about the title because it can mean anything, uh, which I guess you don't get as much in academia. So uh, these days, I just come up with fun ideas for documentaries, and I help other people develop their ideas uh, depending on uh, their products or brands that they are already working with. So usually, I take an idea or a product, and I find creative ways to present it and make it appealing. Now, sometimes that means working on top of a pre-existing story or branding idea or completely building an ecosystem of uh, digital content and television content for uh, a pre-existing uh, brand or E ecosystem. Uh, now, I've been fortunate, uh, and you can see I do wear glasses. I, I really needed them around the scientists because it's the only otherwise, you know, n Neolithic man here. Uh, so I've been fortunate to be nominated for and win uh, a couple Emmys with my design team. And that same motivation has kind of pushed me to be here uh, today and uh, share some of what I've learned with you. Uh, now, like me, you know that awards aren't the goal in this business, uh, but sometimes the subsequent uh, reality of achieving the important goal. So while accolades may be due for you at some point, uh, they will be only as a result of the great things that you do for Mars. So, um, oh, sorry, let me back up. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to more or less go uh, for like 65% storytelling, 20% public opinion, and 25% horse glue BS combo. Um, so <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> it, it is. It tastes funny, but you can uh, work your way around it if, if the mouth feels interesting. Uh, so uh, you're going to have to talk to people that are non-scientists, non-engineers. Once you've got your white papers figured out and everything that that qualifies you and gives you the bona fides to say that you have actually uh, achieved your science, you're going to have to talk about it to normal people. And uh, fortunately, I've worked a little bit on each side, and I don't know which side I'm, I'm on. Um, so uh, I'm here because I think the whole Mars shot is on the verge of something that's bleeding beyond the science world, and in a way, obviously, analog to the moon shot. And we know that th this is what we all know. It's not a secret. Um, Mars is very interesting right now, and the hot, iron's hot for a lot of reasons, and, uh, and many of the reasons uh, are because of the real scientific possibilities that you're involved in, and that's only going to help a wave of public interest in, uh, from entertainment and, uh, and other forces. Now, I like it. Uh, it's good for me because uh, entertainment and documentary are going to benefit from something happening eventually with the Mars shot. Um, and it represents a, a society that has momentum, and that's, I think, what we want. You know, when we see things grinding to a halt, especially people in this uh, room, we, it makes you feel helpless. It's a bummer. So um, I think that the extra horsepower under the hood for excitement for Mars right now uh, is coming from that private commercial competition, these, these new barons of space that we all know, the SpaceXs, and we got to see uh, folks from Virgin yesterday, and there's a Blue Origin out there, and all the other ones that I don't know about. Um, now, the old dogs and the new barons have an incentive to turn their energies towards uh, more public, less insider baseball way of selling the commercial aerospace business items. So the new barons have already put the sexy into the marketing and into that scenario. So 
they've been doing things that we know of like the low Earth orbit tourism game. That's been their big start. Now, the old dogs can't sit by the wayside and settle for the unsexiness that tanked GE and RCA when the big Japanese electronics takeover happened back in the day. Um, or BlackBerry versus Apple, or you know, if it's a space if SpaceX versus Lockheed sort of situation. You know, again, we think of the old dogs and the new dogs. We could have just as easily used uh, BuzzFeed and the New York Times to talk about these, these sorts of changes in revolution. Uh, one thing that you're going to want is people to be interested in Mars. Surprise. We've already got us. We're, we're the converted. Um, the access road to the convertibles, though, is having a conversation that woos the Mars susceptible and emboldens the already converted us. So the one giant goal, keeping one huge goal of getting humans to Mars, it's the kind of singular idea that spawns thousands of cottage industries, inspires millions of young students, and sells a lot of plastic toys. So the best way to stimulate people's interest uh, in this is to make the conversation relatable. It has to bring people as close to possible to the experience of Mars while keeping their feet somewhat on the ground. So you let people know that it's here. Let them know that it's now. Use the tools of storytelling and the immediacy of things like social media to get people's hearts and imaginations on your side. Their minds will follow. So, story, about story. I'm going to work with one of my favorite characters to construct a somewhat scientifically backable uh, idea to talk about story. And the Bering Strait will come in to play. So, F Philippe's gone, but God, I'm so glad he talked about that. Um, so, my character is a caveman living with his tribe in the Paleoith Paleolithic area, uh, era, just uh, north northern Asia, sort of, on the verge of the Bering Strait about 8,000 years ago. His name is Jeff. His wife is Deborah, and they have two kids that haven't taken their adult names yet. It's a strange culture, these uh, cave people, though they will probably uh, name the children Dan and Sarah. So time for a quick note on cultural bias. Uh, don't do it. That's, I did that on purpose just to point out it's, you know, the, your cavemen, your people, anybody that you describe should represent the entire world. That stuff's important. Uh, now, the thing about being part of the Bering Strait migration 12,000 years ago uh, was that you had to deal with mammoths occasionally. You had to because you needed to make little shelters, and it was okay to get meat from them. You could have hunted smaller animals, but whatever, you're a big, tough guy. You can take a mammoth. So by using your superior brain, you first realize mammoths are bigger than me. So you seek the company of friends to distract the mammoth while you sneak up behind it with the spear you used to hunt deer with. Pack hunting worked then, so it should be a great idea now. So let's sneak up behind a huge hairy elephant with spikes on its head the same way. Now Jeff and his two <laughs> friends are dead. Okay, meet Derek. This is Derek. He's Deborah's new husband and the kids are adjusting. <laughs> now since, since Derek was present at the battle of Jeff's a crappy leader, he has two big new human-styled ideas. Number one, there's got to be a better way to do this. Don't just sneak up on the hairy elephant. And two, I'm going to need a bigger spear. <laughs> now, the rest is it's speculative history. It's most likely involved dropping a rock, a big one, on high onto a mammoth and then stabbing it in the top of the spine. We know this because we found records of mammoths with uh, piercings in the, the back of their spines, and we can sort of surmise that it, you really probably needed a bolt or two. Um, now, mostly we know about this story, not because of the death of Jeff, but because of the boasting of Derek, who has survived to tell the world's first relevant big fish story. And because I knew somebody would be hungry for math, that's, uh, he said it was five times bigger. Yeah, not bad, huh? Hey, I tried math once. <laughs> So uh, humans learn how to hunt and stay alive. We learned how to hunt and stay alive in turn because of the collective storytelling uh, and subsequent generations of uh, Derek's and Deborah's. So let's just cut forward a little. Let's throw a bone in the air uh, and cut four million years into the future and a big space station shows up in its place. And I didn't steal that idea from anybody. <laughs> um, now, the important thing about that is that the, the thread between the bone and the spaceship uh, story and useful information is that's the human being's power of collective intelligence. You know, we're as smart as we are because we got to add up all these smarts over the years. Um, and it's one of our greatest assets. 
So stories make facts memorable. Whether I'm Derek the caveman uh, telling Deborah, Darlie, and Jamie, or whoever the kids' names were, uh, some religious-based lesson on the shadows of the cave wall, and it helps them remember the type of rock to use for their spear tip, or I'm drawing on the cave walls in some way to, uh, about the hunt to show future Derek's my wizard-like technique of dropping a big rock on a big animal, um, then I'm going to use colorful, subjective language to get that story off the ground and make it stick. Now, speaking of colorful language, whether you call it exaggeration or lying, doesn't make it uh, a non-variable. Uh, in the established philosophical sense that ego uh, needs a mirror to recognize itself, Derek's stories need to be epic to be remembered. Legendary and unforgettable. And that's in order to amplify the factual, the factual cultural norms meant to be made into record. Now, whether it's in song or religious lore, whether to teach acquired technology or imbue authority, creative language and visuals uh, made stories stick. And, and they, they made stories become the backbone of our nomadic period. And they flourished from then on through the, the times that we went hella agrarian, as they say in California. Um, so Derek's big fish story turned him into an animal god, right? The mammoth acquired four tusks and doubled in size. Welcome to myth and religion. Now that leads us to caveman Derek's spear and your science. So in Western storytelling, it's since become a sword, a six shooter, or a lightsaber. It's a conventional tool given special power by its user. This tool's creation is often mythos. Hardened lumber, stricken by lightning and made unbreakable. A binding of woven deer intestine from a doe who gave birth in the moonlight. And of course, a dragon glass spear tip. Excalibur, Billy the Kid's revolver, Luke's lightsaber, Dave Bowman's explosive bolts, Ripley's power loader, Corbin Dallas's last match, Dr. Brendel's teleporter, Matt Damon's RTG, E.T.'s speak and spell, Caveman Derek's spear, your science. So your idea, your product, your software process, whatever it is, has a likely common goal to be used in the push to get human beings to Mars at some point. So as great as this product is, uh, which is going to here be I'm going to be describing it as a widget. Uh, your product isn't elevated beyond the category of object without first imbuing a memorable and personal intent behind your widget. Your product needs to be part of the Mars story, not just an item in it. So uh, this is, again, the part where I'm very proud of the fact that I'm not a scientist and I don't have to defend anything, I think. Uh, I, I know nothing of the world of academia, peer review, or even discourse on physics blogs. People are so mean. Uh, so a good hero story and actually equating your tech with Excalibur is not going to fix bad science. And that's what you definitely all know more, way more than me. So um, storytelling and PR techniques serve no good to a product that's no good. So I just want, that's my little disclaimer that this isn't. No, you've got to have, uh, you've got to back it up. Um, anyway, your widget is part of a greater story. And that greater story, it's the things that audiences look for when they want to just eat popcorn and turn their, their brain off. Um, now, I understand that you may not have the sexy diamond blade tipped Leatherman that Matt Damon's going to actually use and every father will want on Father's Day. We don't all get to make that tool for the Mars mission. Um, so what if you have something tricky, like a sealant? A sealant that works well with a pre-existing kind of Mars duct tape, which don't take that idea I, seriously. Your sealant, let's say it, it remains at a low viscosity when it's first lifted from the tape roll, and then it instantly gets uh, applied and useful within two minutes uh, to the Martian atmosphere. That's pretty cool. Um, oh, even more radical, the bond on your sealant is three times the required strength to retain uh, atmosphere. So if you need to seal up your suit or something, this is a really great tape. It's still not the spear, though. It's not a lightsaber. It's kind of uh, 
not sexy yet. It's not helping. So ask yourself, if I don't have something as sexy as Excalibur, a lightsaber, uh, or even Derek's spear, what the hell do I have? Maybe you've got something just as fun, something unexpected like the duct tape sealant, the that'll come in handy later widget. So think of those, my favorite ideas are in uh, science fiction. Ripley's power loader, uh, Dave Bowman's explosive bolts, Matt Damon's RTG. Um, these, uh, all these things were hinted at early on. They seemed boring, but then they were very important later in, in the plot. Uh, now, these aren't the main tools of the hero, and your tool might not be the main tool of your hero, but when applied with human intuition and improvisation, they become larger than themselves. So you get some more, some more math as a result of that, you weirdos. Um, but, you know, as you can plainly see from the proof here, you're <laughs> <laughs> much, you're, you create something larger than yourself when you add like that. So Bowman's bolts become uh, these uncontained, literally explosive pathmakers into a cold robotic murderer's heart. Ripley's industrial power loader embodies human innovation to display strengths larger than itself, and it conquers a physically superior foe. Matt Damon's RTG is a feat of engineering providing energy outputs only dreamed of 75 years ago, but as Mark Watney, he just uses it like a caveman to keep warm. So think of your widget this way. If it's not a Excalibur, then what it is is it's a rock and a sling. It's two simple things made deadly through human cunning. The story isn't the tool, the sword, or the Im implement. The story is the implementation of it. It's about the indispensable user, the future of the user. Wrap your tech around that. So um, blazing right into character and world, the things that are gonna live around your widget. Now, traditionally, the character is us. It might be you or your team. Um, all of our best qualities and worst qualities at odds with each other with the intent of persevering. I think that's who we like to think we all are in some way. So what are the odds? And who's the antagonist if it is a person? Now, the case for most of our Mars stories is that the antagonist is either ourselves or the elements. Traditionally, you may have heard uh, of these conflict situations as man versus nature, man versus man, man versus the supernatural, or man versus self. Let's say there's a lot of man in there. So we'll take the most likely scenario and say that it's uh, going to be the key conflict of person versus nature. It's probably what you're all up against. And by the way, notice Deborah lives. Uh, she, she survived two husbands and went on to become an astronaut. Um, just saying, you could have hunted small game. Uh, probably skipped all the, the bullshit in the beginning. So um, this character is going to be a person that we can at least sympathize with. They've been inspired, they've tried, they've failed, and they've triumphed. Now for most of you, you're somewhere between failing and getting back up again and claiming victory. Uh, I think it's easy to surmise with everybody because since nobody's gone to Mars yet, we're all, all, almost at this kind of state. So the world, in the case of the Mars shot, which is my favorite, uh, it, when you talk about a world that your character and your widget inhabit, you're not talking about a planet. You're talking about the rules and forces that are for them or against them. Now, Science fiction is at its best when characters use their widgets to negotiate the hard and fast rules of the world. It's what I like most about a movie like The Martian, living very strictly to the rules of its world, and Mark Watney using his brains and a slightly sub-adequate set of tools to live at the edge of those rules. So here are some of my favorite world devices about The Mars Shot that, I, that are fun to talk about when you talk about your science. So globally, our journey to Mars is less like some imperial colonization of a new land, like the Americas or even the Wild West. See, I, I think it's, it's a lot more like the crossing the Bering Strait. It's a steady migration of a few humans at a time into a new, incredibly extreme environment. It won't be a comfortable outpost for a long time, but we'll adapt like our ancestors did and stretch our resources further than Lewis and Clark could have even imagined. Uh, 
lily padding, uh, this idea that we've already heard in a lot of discussions today of being able to use the low gravity uh, environments of like uh, the moon or Phobos as jumping off points or using their orbits to store uh, resources. It's a fantastic part of world to discuss. A lot of people don't know about this stuff. It's great. Um, the importance of weight reduction and in situ resource generation. That stuff, again, you know, everybody just figures you're bringing your own food and, uh, and you'll have some solar panels. I, I was surprised at how many awesome things go into this that I didn't know as a, as a lay person. So um, light speed delay, ugh, how slow is light speed? Um, it, it's actually kind of a problem. It's, it's the, the classic, uh, you know, talk to, uh, uh, you know, your call from St. Louis has gone through. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, using uh, counterweights to generate uh, enough gravity to not just only be floating your entire way back and forth between Mars and here. That's a great, it's an interesting, wonderful story world device. Uh, space freighters like the Aldrin Cycler and sort of an endless loop going between the Earth and Mars. Again, wonderful device. Uh, and our periodic table of elements. I don't think that many people know that with a lot of the resources that you have on Mars, you can make one thing with another thing, one gas with another. You can microwave some regolith and uh, maybe get some steam for your bath or some water for your body. <laughs> Tends to be important. Um, now, uh, quickly about story structure and when you talk about your Mars technology and what uh, and how you would structure a story about your technology. Uh, in the Western tradition, we employ a three-act story structure. Uh, it's not totally universal, but it, there's, there's interesting uh, four-act structures uh, in Asia and elsewhere. Um, now, we uh, all understand that the tools a hero used, uh, they don't define her. The human, it's human ingenuity that the hero uses that makes technology shine. So when we see technology in a story, it either behaves like a lightsaber or it might behave like the power loader. Now a lightsaber is used as it was intended with surprising elegance. The power loader is used alternative to its intention with the spark of human ingenuity. So how does your widget fit into the story? Is it a cudgel, a tool, is it multipurposed? How is your tool used in practice, in improvisation, and then in per per perpetuity? What about your widget fits into the greater human story of exploration and triumph? So, how to build a story structure. Act one is where we establish a world in stasis. It's a world without change or innovation. The need for your technology exists, but it's unaddressed. It isn't a sadder world, and it isn't an infomercial with people who can't just seem to figure out a toaster either. It's not that desperate. But it's a world that just plain lacks. In act one, we're presented a glimpse of a world in which change is possible, and a world with new exciting possibilities lays before us. In act two, we recognize the stakes of accepting a new world and the rules of that world. The tool, your widget, becomes an instrument or a reminder of our char character's growing power. Halfway through Act 2, we face a test, likely using our Excalibur or getting into the womb pod with explosive bolts, or having our first battle with the lightsaber. This isn't only a test of the character or team's metal, but of their hardware and of your widget. Act three, that's the ultimate test. That's what none of us have seen yet because we haven't seen Mars yet. It's where everything is tied up and the hardest challenge has been faced. Everybody gets a medal. <laughs> or they get to live. Or you get to have an acid trip and die in front of a monolith, <laughs> which is okay too. Um, so the character and their team has faced extremes. They've maybe encountered a lot of loss. They've even become worse for the wear. We call this in storytelling being sadder but wiser. The widget has performed its duties admirably and is placed dutifully on a shelf, uh, or it's given to Ray 30 years later, or it sits in orbit around Jupiter until an inferior movie with Roy Scheider needs it. <laughs> Sorry, it sucked. 2010 sucked. Okay. Um, now, you don't need to be as dramatic as any of these examples here just listed, but they do illustrate a mindset that'll help you frame your story around your product. Most importantly, this is the bringing Earth back to Mars part. So, um, what's the world today that you want to establish? It's the world without your widget. Give us a brief on yourself or your team as a character with human emotions. Uh, who was your mentor? What kind of training were you given? 
um, with a vision of a world that can now benefit from your widget and a knowledge of the science it would take to produce said widget, you tested your hypothesis, you test it on paper, you move on to prototypes, you went through a roller coaster of near misses, false positives, and the occasional process moving forward, which I think you may have all seen and at some point in your product creation. Some point through at, halfway through Act 2, you've had one of those rubber meets the road, final prototype, real world simulation, driverless car faced with an empty stroller at 20 miles an hour test. Now it doesn't matter if you fail or succeed here, what matters is that you know what you need to know in order to face the ultimate test, going to Mars. Act 3 is the present and future of your widget and the world that needs it. A almost like the act, act 1 all over again. It's exciting because it act actually represents the present and future of you and your technology. Now, let's go back to the uh, glorious, unforgettable additive quick seal in our Mar Mars duct tape. Um, no matter how small it may seem, you could be creating something that leaves a legacy and, and, has, a, and has forward momentum. The cool thing about all your products, they have to be the best. I mean, there's a tolerance level of for everything that you're making. I think that's a fascinating story point in itself. So what goes up must come down. There's a growing negative impression that everyone on down from Elon Musk's uh, that wants to go to Mars is an escapist. Uh, now, we mostly know otherwise. Mars enthusiasts and the Mars curious, uh, now they, they don't all just want to board a SpaceX Mega Dragon and take off forever and, and go to the stars. Some of them do, I, you know. Uh, but uh, inspire yourself. I like to go to uh, NASA's spin-off website and look for the most boring things I can, and then the most amazing ways that they have spun off into Earth technologies. Um, the road to Mars is a huge aspirational project, and there will be, there will be uh, failures, gloriously beautiful failures that will benefit us here along the way. Um, so if your heat shield spray keeps melting test dummies, maybe it would be a good uh, nonstick <laughs> additive for your waffle iron. Point being, keep your feet on the earth when it comes to public opinion. Make your widget a catalyst for good things that will benefit those of us not going to Mars. Think about the humane. Create a truly rising tide. Mars spin-offs that help those that need it most in developing worlds have a lot of uh, parallels with, um, well, spin-offs from Mars could help the developing world a lot. But don't force it. If you're not making something like a water filter or a solar array that's going to save you know, the most difficult parts of Africa to live in, don't force it into your story. Uh, so the first humans on Mars will be a direct reflection of our own humanity and abilities as a unique species. Tell a diverse, wide story with all kinds of people in it. That's one of the most important things. And our first major discoveries there will remind us of the delicacies of our own planet. So uh, to quickly recap, I realize I'm out uh, here. Make your science fit into a structured story. Use the laws of science to create rich worlds for your technology. Bring us back to Earth and relate to the audience on their terms. Thank you very much.